When studying the relationship between the sciences and humanities, it seems inevitable that one would study Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. The novel is often called the earliest example of science fiction. And indeed, often when we think of Frankenstein, we think of a mad scientist bullying his way forward so successfully that the novel is now perceived as a cautionary tale against the transgressive natures of bold science. But distracted by this iconic status, we often overlook the other messages the novel may offer. For instance, James Riger, a definitive editor of the 1818 Frankenstein edition, suggests that the novel isn't even science fiction. He denounces Shelley's competence in the sciences and asserts that, quote, Frankenstein's chemistry is switched on magic, souped up alchemy, the electrification of Agrippa and Paracelsus, end quote. And as if to strip away every possible title that could be awarded to the novel, he adds that, quote, it is a mistake to call Frankenstein a pioneer work of science fiction, end quote. As we explore Frankenstein, our goal will be to determine whether the book is indeed a work of science fiction. That is, does Shelley's novel imagine, explore, and examine the science of her time? We'll also examine what kind of messages Frankenstein conveys about the uses of science. But in order to do this, we will in turn need to study the novel's contexts, and through these contextual studies, we will also begin to discover the narrative of suffering and creation that drove the sciences and arts together into the creation of Frankenstein. Shelley begins her 1831 introduction to Frankenstein with the question many in her day pondered. She asks, quote, How I, then, a young girl, came to think of and to dilate upon so very hideous an idea, end quote. The question itself underlines the grotesque nature of the book, which has captivated audiences for over two centuries. That is, the book is hideous because it is grotesque. Grotesqueness is a concept of dissonance and hybridity. In ancient literature, grotesque beasts are those that combine two or more creatures together. This includes the centaur, the mermaid, the minotaur, the griffin, and the basilisk. In the text, the monster is likewise grotesque. He's made of bits and pieces pilfered nefariously from graveyards and charnel houses. He is quite literally the incongruous combination of various body parts mashed together into one form. The novel's form is also grotesque. It is an epistolary novel, which means it is written as a collection of letters. And in doing this, it stitches together the voices of Frankenstein, Walton, Alphonse, Clerval, Elizabeth, and later, as we'll hear, the monster himself. In response to Shelley's question, how did she come to think of and dilate upon so hideous of an idea, she gives four responses. These are her parents, the science of the times, nature, and her infamous dream. We will proceed through each of these factors to gain an understanding of the contexts which led to the unification of science and arts in this iconic novel. From birth, Mary's life was overshadowed by death. She was the daughter of the infamous Mary Wollstonecraft and political revolutionary William Godwin. Whereas Godwin was painfully shy, given to intellectualizing, and apparently still a virgin at the age of 40, Wollstonecraft, just three years his junior, was passionate and reckless, never taking heed from anyone, male or female. She is, many would say, one of the earliest, truest, prototypical feminists. However, in her own time, she was often ignored in favor of later, safer, more conservative figures, who helped herald in the feminist cause. Godwin was a philosopher and a forefather of anarchism. Wollstonecraft was one of the first to loudly argue against the idea that women were somehow innately inferior to men. Before she met Godwin, she had two affairs, both of which almost led to her impassioned suicide, and one of which introduced her to Henry Fuseli, another iconic figure of romanticism. Fuseli is the artist who painted The Nightmare, a piece sometimes used on the covers of Frankenstein novels. The painting is depicted here and shows a woman seemingly filled with erotic desire, looked upon by a ghostly horse with bulging pale eyes, and pinned down by an incubus, a male demon who had sexual intercourse with women in their sleep. The painting and Wollstonecraft's relationship with the painter underscore prominent themes of romantic art and philosophy. In the Romantic era, beauty was often seen as haunting. It disrupts one's reality and possesses a person as a thing, which means he must, in return, repossess himself. Likewise, sex was frequently connected to creation, for literal and metaphorical means. 
In this time of chaotic feeling, Wollstonecraft and Godwin eventually met and married and gave birth to Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, the author-to-be of Frankenstein. Unfortunately, it would be another century before sanitation would truly be understood. The doctor who helped with the delivery did not wash his hands before or during the procedure, and Mary's mother died of sepsis ten days after giving birth. Mary would forever be haunted by her mother's death. A large portrait of her hung over the mantel. Every time an old friend or acquaintance came, they talked about her. Godwin continued to idolize her after her death. One of Mary's earliest memories is of her father taking her to a mother's grave and learning how to spell her name by tracing the letters on her mother's tombstone. And when Mary declared her love to Percy Shelley, it was over her mother's tombstone as well. Many argue that it is Mary's unspoken fear that her birth caused her mother's death that lends such great urgency to her narratives and need to create life in reality or in fiction, insisting upon her ability to nurture rather than smother the romantic ideals of creation and creativity. Mary's life was not only filled with death, it was filled with loneliness. She idolized the one parent she had left, but this was a one-sided relationship. She remarked once that, quote, until I knew Shelley, I may justly say that Godwin was my god, end quote but it seemed that Godwin was simply incapable of reciprocation. Perhaps it was because he desired a son, or because he was never expressive in the first place, but Mary was often crushed by his lack of intimacy and attention. She also had plenty of competition for her father's attention. By the time she was five years old, she lived in a house of five children, and no child had the same two parents. Her older sister, Fanny, came from one of the affairs her mother had before Godwin, a stepbrother and sister were married into the family along with a new stepmother, and finally her new stepmother and Godwin eventually gave birth to a half-brother named William, a particularly crushing blow for Mary since William, her father's name, was supposed to have been her name as the firstborn to Godwin if she had been born the boy he wanted. All this created an environment of loss and desire for Mary Shelley, and she found a way to express these tormented emotions through romantic art and philosophy. As mentioned, the act of creation and supremacy of imagination are central to all romantic writers, and in her youth, Mary would listen to these discussions of creativity between the visitors at her father's home. Among these visitors was Samuel Taylor Coleridge, a leading romantic poet. In 1806, when she was nine, he visited, and as she hid behind the family sofa, listening in on the adult conversations, he recited what is now his most renowned poem, the rhyme of the ancient mariner. It is the kind of poem that hypnotizes with its rhythm and fascinates with its story, and it clearly left an impression on Mary, for she would recall it forty years later in her journal, writing, quote, Alone, alone, all, all alone upon the wide, wide sea, and God will not take pity on my soul in agony. She also makes reference to the poem in Frankenstein. As Walton prepares to embark upon his journey to the north, he quotes Coleridge to his sister, quote, I am going to unexplored regions, to the land of mist and snow, but I shall kill no albatross, therefore do not be alarmed for my safety, end quote. Like the ancient mariner of the poem, Mary was burdened by suffering and loneliness. In 1814, when Mary ran away with Percy Shelley, another famous poet and disciple of Godwin, the rift between her and her father deepened. Afterwards, Godwin didn't speak to her for three and a half years, and Mary only succeeded in entangling herself in further family drama. When she ran off with Percy, he was already married and with two children. They also ran off with her sister, Clara Jane Claremont, or as she fancifully called herself, Claire Claremont. Claire competed with Mary for Percy's affections, and by the end of 1814, it is likely that Claire and Percy were already lovers, while Percy himself attempted to push Mary on his friend, Thomas Jefferson Hogg, who had developed an attraction to the young author-to-be. In 1815, Mary then gave birth to Percy's daughter, two months premature. The doctor, the same who had delivered Mary and killed her mother with his unsanitary measures, told Mary that the child would not live, but Mary, in defiance, put the baby to her breast to suckle it, and after two days, it finally took milk. It was at this time that Percy, who had been spending most of his time with Claire, decided that they should move, and so Mary, with her eight-day-old premature baby, were forced to travel. On the eleventh day, the child was dead. She had never named the baby, but had grown attached to her. Forever afterwards, she frequently daydreamed of her and made references to her in her journal. 
Most of all, Mary constantly questioned whether she could create life rather than death in those she loved. This is what leads us to her inquiries into science. Mary was not the only one to ponder the causes of life. This had become one of the pivotal questions in the scientific community of the time. Since the 17th century, scientists had been locked in debates over the validity of spontaneous generation, the idea that life may spring from non-living matter. The idea came from observations that meat left out for prolonged periods would soon become riddled with maggots. Likewise, fruit and bread left out for a time would produce mold and bugs. Even Erasmus Darwin, one of the most popular men of science in the early 19th century, and the grandfather to Charles Darwin, author of On the Origin of Species, became a proponent of spontaneous generation. He argued that he saw little eels come to life from a slurry of wheat flour and water, and in 1802, he concluded that, quote, even the organic particles of dead animals may, when exposed to a due degree of warmth and moisture, regain some degree of vitality, end quote. In fact, it was to spontaneous generation that he attributed the origins of evolution. The idea of spontaneous generation would eventually be definitively debunked by Louis Pasteur in 1859, allowing for much needed improvements in sanitation and disease prevention. But until then, the debate was very much alive. In the late 18th century, Luigi Galvini joined the discussion. He found that dead matter will move when stimulated by certain metals and electrical charges. He discovered this by experimenting with frog legs, and the word galvanize derives from his work. Galvini became convinced that he had discovered a new kind of electricity, a biological electricity that was the vital fluid of life, or perhaps simply life itself. Galvini's work was legendary, and his nephew, Luigi Aldini, would continue his work touring all of Europe during the early 19th century, demonstrating how electrical charges could move not only the legs of frogs, but eyes and tongues of severed ox heads as well. In fact, he did not stop there. Eventually, Aldini began a series of presentations in London, where he would demonstrate the effects of galvanism on the corpses of newly hanged criminals. Aldini claimed that by applying electricity, he could make the body sit up, hoist its arms, wiggle its fingers, and blow out candles. Here, we see an image of Dr. Andrew Ure, who claimed that galvanic stimulation could restore life in cases of suffocation, drowning, and hanging. He described the event thus, quote, Every muscle of the body was immediately agitated with convulsive movements resembling a violent shuddering from cold. On moving the second rod from hip to heel, the knee being previously bent, the leg was thrown out with such violence as nearly to overturn one of the assistants, who in vain tried to prevent its extension. The body was also made to perform the movements of breathing by stimulating the phrenic nerve and the diaphragm. When the supraorbital nerve was excited, every muscle in his countenance was simultaneously thrown into fearful action. Rage, horror, despair, anguish, and ghastly smiles united their hideous expressions in the murderer's face surpassing far the wildest representations of Fuseli or Akeen. At this period, several of the spectators were forced to leave the apartment from terror or sickness, and one gentleman fainted." End quote. These scientific experiments made their way to Mary Shelley through various avenues, not just as discussions of galvanism and electricity that seems to trickle or streak through the bodies of corpses, but as discussions of vitalism, a contending scientific philosophy that believed electricity was the source of life. Samuel Taylor Coleridge was one of the most vocal proponents of vitalism. But even if Shelley had not known Coleridge, she would have heard of the philosophy through her husband and her husband's physician, William Lawrence, one of the key figures of the early 19th century who debated the issue at the Royal Society in London. She also would have heard of these theories from conversations between Percy Shelley and Lord Byron. In fact, this was the topic of conversations during the infamous summer of 1816, when she, her husband-to-be Percy, her stepsister Claire Clermont, Claire's ex-lover Lord Byron, and Lord Byron's physician John Polidori spent a summer at Byron's elegant estate house above Lake Geneva in Switzerland. The summer of 1816 was actually one of the coldest and rainiest on record. The previous year, the Indonesian mountain of Tambora had erupted in what was the largest and deadliest volcanic eruption of the last 10,000 years, spewing forth large amounts of ash and debris. Although the eruption was given little notice in Britain, its effects were indirectly felt. The debris in the atmosphere lowered temperatures around the globe by an average 1 degree Fahrenheit. 
and this had a massive ripple effect. Floods and frosts came that destroyed corn and potato crops all over Europe and America. In Ireland, rain fell for eight straight weeks. On the American East Coast, as far as Pennsylvania, lakes and rivers remained iced over in the summer. Foot-long icicles were reported. Everywhere famine set in, typhus spread. Switzerland saw the worst violence as whole populations grew hungry, looted, and rioted. At the same time, the large amounts of pyroclasts in the air led to unusually spectacular sunsets, as featured here by J. M. W. Turner in, in Chester Canal. The yellow tinge being the effect of volcanic debris in the atmosphere. So, on one hand, 1816 was a strange and dark year for many, while also one of nature's most dazzling and bewitching summers. It was during this awe-inspiring year in June that Mary Shelley sat with her four companions, trying to pass the dark and stormy summer nights, bordered by the White Alps and glassy lakes. To entertain the guests, Byron read from a French collection of German horror stories called *Phantasmagoria*. He liked to frighten people, and he relished every chance to set his audience on edge as the thunder crashed and the wind howled outside. Upon finishing, Byron closed the book and proposed a contest. Each of them would write a ghost story. Percy and Byron both wrote fragments that they quickly abandoned. John Polidori wrote *The Vampire*, the first and most influential novel to depict a human vampire that lusted after the lifeblood of others. This would become the model for later works, including Bram Stoker's *Dracula*. And of course, Mary Shelley wrote *Frankenstein*. Shelley's account of the dream upon which *Frankenstein* is based tells us several things. It draws parallels between her situation as an author. And Frankenstein's situation as a scientist or scholar, this blending represents the holism of romantic thought. With these blurred boundaries, it also suggests that answers to our earlier questions, such as "Is the novel a work of science fiction?" and "What is the novel's stance on the sciences?" will not be clear-cut. Instead, it emphasizes a philosophy we've seen in other works of the 19th century, and that is that truth requires balance between ideality and reality. Between sleepfulness and wakefulness, death and life, objectivity and subjectivity, and so forth. Finally, the description insists upon the narrator's spontaneity, that is, its organic rather than mechanical nature. Though Shelley and we have broken down the causes that have led her to the production of her hideous progeny, as she says, the product itself, the novel, and the life captured in its pages, remain once again to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator. And deny easy answers.